Russian Tsar Nicholas I commissioned German architect Leo von Klenzer to construct the building of the new hermitage. It was intended to be a modern art museum for Russia. The Neo-Greek style of the building was chosen as a tribute to the past. The portico of the new hermitage is decorated by figures of Atlantis, carved by the sculptor Tiribinev. For a long time, the main entrance to the museum was there. A collection of Flemish art, acquired by Catherine the Great, is displayed on the first floor. The collection ranks alongside those of the world's most prominent art galleries. It numbers over 500 canvases and gives an idea of the creativity of 140 painters of the time. Peter Paul Rubens was called the King of Painters and Painter of Kings. The collection numbers over 40 works by Rubens, from monumental religious and mythological subjects to portraits, drawings and sketches for the decoration of palaces. The world of gods and voluptuous mythological figures created by Rubens amazes the viewer with its overt sexuality. His works display majestic and thrilling power. Rubens lived and worked when the Baroque style dominated in Europe. He was its single exuberant genius, violent in action, treatment and expression. The colouring of his paintings is based on a contrast of naked bodies and bright, resplendent robes. All his creative life, Rubens propagated the values of humanism and peace and glorified the power of nature with elaborate Baroque splendour. Perseus and Andromeda, one of Rubens' masterpieces, is based on the mythological subject of antiquity, when Perseus killed a dragon and set Princess Andromeda free. In the painting, Rubens introduced Andromeda as an opulent, red-haired Flemish woman. Perseus gently touches the arm of the embarrassed girl, while the dead monster is spread out at his feet. The tense muscles of Pegasus, the flattering draperies, the impetuous motion of glory and armours. A winged goddess with a laurel. Every detail in the painting proclaims health and power, all astir with victory. Rubens worshipped the myth of the triumphant victory of justice over evil so much that he reproduced it on the facade of his house in Antwerp. Mens sana in corpore sano, words by the Roman poet Juvenalis, are carved above the entrance of his house in Antwerp. It means a healthy mind in a healthy body. The saying was a motto of Rubens and of the whole golden age in Flemish art.
The split of the Netherlands in the 17th century caused a division of art into the Flemish school and the Dutch school. The country was divided into the Dutch Republic, including Holland, and the Spanish Netherlands, including Flanders. Hence, the art schools of the two communities developed essentially different characteristics. Art in Flanders was supported mainly by prosperous merchants and the mighty church. Large-scale compositions peopled with small genre, portraits of the nobility and still life were created for castles and palaces, while the wealthy church commissioned expensive altarpieces. Antwerp was the capital of Flanders at that time. The statue at the Grote Market is dedicated to Barbo, who once saved the city from a giant. He chopped off his hand and threw it in the river. The words hand-throwing in Dutch mean handwerpen, hence the city's name, Antwerpen. Rubens is a symbol of and the pride of Antwerp. He was a humanist, philologist, archaeologist, statesman and diplomat. Rubens' versatility creates an affinity between him and masters of the Renaissance. One of the finest early paintings by Rubens is the Union of Earth and Water, where characters from antiquity personify the unification of the two elements. The abundant union of earth and water promises fertility, wealth and prosperity to man. The union is blessed by the allegorical figure of glory descended from Olympus. Below, a voluptuous and hearty triton rises up to celebrate it. Sibylle, the Phrygian earth goddess embodies the fertility of the earth. Neptune, the sea god, is entered into a symbolic alliance to secure peace and welfare for the painter's native land. By appealing to the concept of the two elements, earth and water, which was common in European painting, Rubens interprets certain political expectations of the day. The union of earth and water means the union of Antwerp and the Scheldt River. Flanders lost an outlet to the sea, after the Dutch captured the mouth of the river. The beauty of the naked bodies, the rich colouring, and a joyful feeling arising from the work turns it into a triumphant hymn to life. The idea of the Roman charity was used by Rubens and his contemporaries quite often. The story was narrated by Valerius Maximus, a Roman writer of the times of Emperor Tiberius. A young Roman woman, named Pero, breastfed her father, Simon, who was sentenced to starvation in jail. The daughter's charity aroused deep admiration and was ranked as one of the deeds of the ancient heroes. It is supposed that the lady in the portrait of a lady-in-waiting to the Infanta Isabella is the image of his elder daughter, Clara Serena, who died at the age of 12. That is how Rubens imagined her as if she had lived. Her lovely face, with its light blush and delicate blue shades, radiates tenderness. It is masterly offset by a gorford white collar. The portrait reveals a thoughtful intimacy so unusual for the typically violent temper of Rubens. The energetic and exuberant art of Rubens resounded through the age and beyond. The greater part of his creative work, Rubens dedicated to the church. The monumental triptych, The Descent from the Cross, was painted for the altarpiece of Antwerp Cathedral. The central part of the triptych is held in the hermitage. Christ's body is supported cautiously by Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus and the young John. For the last time, Mary embraces her son. The golden-haired Mary Magdalene takes the teacher in her arms.
Rubens heightened the luminosity of Christ's white body against the bright draperies. The caring men guide Christ, whose dead hand rests in the warm hand of Mary Magdalene. Landscapes were not frequent subjects in Rubens' paintings. The stone carriers is one of them. Rubens took nature as the backdrop to human activity. It is exhausting work to push a heavy cart through the potholes and over bumps. Day changes into night. A gloomy moon rises up over the marshes, the towering hills and rocks, the twisting trees and rushing rain clouds. All are details of the majestic and solemn landscape and celebrate the greatness of all-powerful nature. Bacchus was painted by Rubens in his late years. A warm, golden light covers the figures and the distant hills in the background. The painter rejected a traditional image of Bacchus as a handsome young man. On the contrary, he introduced the wine god as a rough-looking cove in traditional Flemish folk taste. This Bacchus is not a glorification of an orgy, however. Male and female figures, along with the reckless boys, are united by the life-giving water. The voluptuous Bacchanalia scene again personifies the might of nature. Rubens developed the style of picture where mythological characters and allegorical scenes combine with elements of historical painting. Five sketches from a large cycle of the life of Marie de' Medici are held in the Hermitage. One of them is the coronation of Marie de' Medici. Rubens' amazing rate of productivity indicates that he worked with numerous assistants. Quite often he made only the initial sketches which were to be further executed by his pupils. He determined the design, balance of tones, established dominant rhythms, and in the final stages, he would pull together the work of his assistants. Rubens won undying world fame and the sincere respect of his contemporaries on a par with Titian, thanks to his vigorous gift for painting and his critical attention to detail. Rubens lived a long and fruitful life. He was buried in the church of St. Jacob in the heart of Antwerp. International in scope, as no artist had been before him, Rubens covered a wide range of arts. He inspired a great number of talented painters in Flanders and abroad. Anthony van Dyck an outstanding student of Rubens is distinguished by his delicate sensitivity and complete mastery of portraiture. The Hermitage collection numbers over 20 works by Van Dyck, mostly portraits. Van Dyck's works married precise physical likenesses into elaborate Baroque splendor.
The self-portrait is considered an absolute masterpiece of the Hermitage collection. The portrait is a perfect illustration of a sublime personality, bohemian and independent. The viewer can see the precocious genius, a child of fortune, refined, charming, relaxed and elegant. The family portrait is an early work of Anthony van Dyck. It is thought that the master depicted the family of his collaborator, the landscape painter Jan Wildens. Its compact composition gives an impression of intimacy and family harmony. Van Dyck focused on the quiet face of the lady and on the pale face of her husband with its sharp features and troubled look. In London, Anthony van Dyck mainly painted portraits of the nobility at the court of Henrietta Maria, Queen of England, of which Portrait of Ladies in Waiting is an example. The postures of the characters, their elegant dress and dazzling entourage, consisting of a landscape and brocade, are typical for gala portraits. A thorough study of texture and jewels along with a wonderful palette demonstrates van Dyck's pictorial virtuosity. Apparently, the rest on the flight into Egypt was painted for the Bachelor's Brotherhood, dedicated to the Virgin in Antwerp. As such, the painting is rich with symbols of the Virgin. The sunflower above Mary emphasizes her divinity, while the partridges symbolize degeneracy and hurry to flee before her purity. The pomegranate at her feet is a symbol of chastity and resurrection. The apple tree giving shelter to the Holy Family symbolizes the overcoming of original sin. Few masters through the annals of art history have truly succeeded in painting infants. Van Dyck not only succeeded, but enjoyed it very much too. He painted the portrait of Philadelphia and Elizabeth Wharton, daughters of Philip Wharton, an English peer. The girls no doubt are well informed about regal bearing. The young models, however, are notable for their graceful ease. The fact that the English aristocracy commissioned Van Dyck to paint numerous family portraits brought forward the mature stage of his work. The combination of a native Flemish zeal and of an amazing creativity enabled him to complete a portrait within one day, sometimes within several hours. His aim was fascination, not excitement. To achieve it, he constantly worked on his technique. The nobility was charmed with the particular restraint of his sitters, with their hauteur and a tinge of sadness. Van Dyck is considered a pan-European master, not only Flemish, because he worked in Italy and England too. He spent his last ten years in England at the court of Charles I, who knighted him. Franz Snyders painted four large-scale still-life pieces for Antoine Trieste, Bishop of Bruges, who was an art lover. The paintings represent traditional stalls, the game stall, the fruit stall, the fish stall and the vegetable stall. Flanders gave still life a character of monumental decorative art. Similar dynamic compositions were commissioned for the interior decorations of castles. In this genre, Snyder's is ranked next to Rubens, whom he greatly admired. It is known that the stalls were painted under Rubens' influence. 
Snyder's marvellous handling of light reflecting off objects infused fruit with a tempting succulence. His large, complicated arrangements turned an ordinary still life into a song for the abundance of nature. A routine visit to the greengrocer is interpreted by Snyder's as an event in itself, where the golden fruit and ripe vegetables look even more delicious than in real life. The abundance of nature and the richness of the depths is generously represented in his grandiose canvases. The colourful mass of fruit and vegetables, of game and fish, arranged in striking combinations, perfectly set off one another. The abundance of food seems to broaden the space, with food lying all over the table, hanging down the sides or dropped onto the floor. A fruit basket overturned by a monkey, a dog peeping out from under the table, a horse reaching for the vegetables. Every detail of the scene glorifies the spirit of good old Flanders, of the people's love for the gifts of nature and of the dream of a land of plenty. The textures, whether the glossy scales of a fish or the coat of a hare, are masterly treated with a passion for naturalism. The generosity of the animal and vegetable world is the main subject of Snyder's still life work. The unexpected arrangement and sharp lighting reveals its diversity and recalls more life than death. After Rubens' death, Jakob Jordens became the head of the Flemish artistic school. Jordens favoured traditional genre scenes. Very often, he painted celebrations and introduced himself as a participant. The King Drinks represents a celebration on the eve of the Epiphany. The King is a figure of Flemish folklore associated with the Epiphany and its feasting. The participants shared a pie with one bean baked inside. The lucky one who got the bean was titled the Bean King, the head of the feast. Topped with a fake crown, he was to choose the queen and her court, from minister to jester. Obeying the king, everybody was to drink by the king's order. Uproarious merriment overcame any remnants of good manners. During Jordan's times, such feasts started at midday and finished after midnight. The grandiose and triumphant paintings by Rubens, Van Dyck, Snyders and Jordans gave way to the so-called chamber painting in Flanders. David Tanias, the younger, not directly connected with Rubens, was an outstanding master of the small genre. However, he was a court painter to Archduke Leopold Wilhelm. Tanias succeeded in outdoor scenes with tiny figures, carousing in a kermis or festivals. He developed a distinctive flair for the needs and taste of the day. The realistic landscapes in his genre scenes emphasize the theatricality of peasants. 
In Europe of the 17th century, the word Flemish was a synonym for intellect and taste. The Flemish masters glorified their national type of beauty and demonstrated a positive attitude towards the full-blooded life with all its pleasure and sorrow.